So wherever you are in the world, welcome back. And thank you for being here. Um, and our next speaker is Brigitte Webster. Many of you will have seen her videos and you saw her pottage video last night. Hi, Tom. There went her husband. Um, and so, <laughs> so she is from the Tudor and 17th century experience. Um, she has a place where you can, I don't know now with COVID, if people can come to see you and stay with you, you can maybe talk a little bit about that. But she is a Tudor cookery historian expert, all things related to Tudor cookery and food. And I see you have a book there by you too. So I want to make sure that we uh, don't forget to mention that. Um, so thank you so much for the video you did on the pottages last night. People loved them. Um, and thank you so much for being here and coming back to TudorCon for the second year. You were with us in person last year in Pennsylvania and this year you are here virtually. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna mute myself now. And then after your talk, I'll go through and read the chats and ask you questions and stuff, okay? Okay. All right. Right, hello everybody and thank you Heather for allowing me back. Um, after so many great speakers, I am sure you are having an absolutely great time and hopefully you're now ready to step back into Tudor England on this really wet cold day here in Norfolk and take part in my dessert course, The Banquet, here in the Great Hall, where in the early 1500s, Sir Edward Chamberlain and his wife would have thrown many feasts and banquets. Now, um, unlike today, the banquet in Tudor times only referred to the very last part of the feast, which was um, more or less a dessert course and by special invitation only. The term banquet derives from the Italian word bancetto, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is a small a uh, side table or bench on which the food was served. Uh, the first time the word banquet appeared um, in print in its plural form, banquetis, was actually in 1483 um, in Caxton's edition of the Golden Legend. Now, during uh, Henry the uh, seventh reign, um, the feast incorporated sweet as well as savory dishes. Uh, and they sat, sat side by side. And at the end of a feast, um, the arrival of the so-called void um, signaled to all the people that the end of the feast feast has come and they would get up and the staff would come and clear the table and take them away. And during that process called the void, the diners got up and they enjoyed a drink of Hippocrates in very fancy Italian glassware. And uh, with that drink, they would have uh, a last minute nibble, nipple, which is um, wafers. They came either looking like this or that. We talk about them a little bit later. And also something called comfits, which are sugar glazed uh, seeds. Uh, by the 1540s, things started to change. And in fact, by the 1550s, the chronicler Hall uses the word banquet as a synonym for the older French term of the void. And interestingly, by the second half of the 
the 16th century, so we're talking Elizabethan times, with the increasing availability of sugar and the ever-growing range of uh, sweet foodstuffs available, the banquet became all the rage amongst the nobility. Uh, its chief purpose was to impress with lavish, dramatic displays and to show off the host's wealth, power and good taste, of course. Um, only the most costly and rarest foods, such, ex as, such as expensive spices or imported dried fruits and sugar were served at such banquets. The food had to sell wealth, power, influence, and most importantly, sex. So a true Tudor knockout in the very sense. Uh, and one of uh, the main attractions of this banquet was also that it provided the people with privacy and it was taken away from the prying eyes and ears of the servants. So very much the Tudor style of clubbing, if you might like to call it that. Uh, you see, during a feast, the diners were seated according to their position and standing and in society. And in the following banquet course, however, there was a lot much more freedom of choice where you wanted to sit and who you wanted to talk about. However, dietary authors generally were very hostile to what they considered the grossly extravagant and unruly banqueting habits of the courtiers. And in Henry VIII's time, the, the banquet started to move away from the feasting scene held here in the Great Hall to a much warmer and private place somewhere else in the house. That could be the great chamber upstairs or uh, a withdrawing room, which in our case is that way. And now my library. Uh, and from those banqueting rooms, it really was only a small step to the banqueting houses. Uh, the most famous banqueting house featured at Hampton Court. No surprise there, really, you'd say. Uh, it was built by Henry in 1527 to entertain the French ambassadors and sadly uh, was demolished in the 17th century. Uh, and during the reign of Elizabeth I, many of these banqueting rooms actually moved to the rooftop um, uh, as seen at Hardwick Hall, if you've been there before. And sometimes they moved those banqueting rooms into a cave, uh, such as a grotto they often created and then decorated with little shells. But my personal favorite one uh, must be the one that Francis Bacon had on his little island sat in the moat, which he had designed in the ancient Roman style. The earliest banqueting houses were of a very, a very temporary design. And the field of cloth. Now about the food. Uh, Banqueting food was made not by the cook, 
but by skilled artisans, the so-called confectioners. And of course, Henry VIII had his own confectionery at Hampton Court. And um, the interesting thing for me is that during the late 16th century, so Elizabethan times, um, the lady of the house started to make these confections, just as the confections and their popularity spread down the social scale. For those who neither had the time or the skill to make any of these, uh, you could also purchase them in specialty shops as the accounts of two families in particular, the, Wil uh, the Wilbur's and the Middleton family show us clearly. Now let's explore some of the food that was actually served because I was busy in the kitchen. I prepared quite a nice <laughs> palette for you because you need to see them. I'm, I'm sorry you can't smell them or taste them on this occasion, but let's have a look at what there was. Basically, we have two groups. We have the subtleties and we have the uh, sweet meats. Let's start with the subtleties. And I'm going to reach over here and I'm going to show you some. The subtleties were basically table ornaments uh, and all made from sugar paste. Let me just bring it up a bit better like this. I hope you can see. Uh, so the sugar paste was made from brown sugar, gum dragon, egg white and liquid. And most of the time that was rose water. Um, this paste then dried hard, uh, white, and was often painted. Now, my very, very talented daughter made these out of sugar paste. Um, you can see, for instance, uh, a very popular one was cards, playing cards made of sugar paste. Uh, we have animals. Here, I think that's a deer she made. Or a wolf. Um, the most uh, elaborate and costly and impressive uh, subtleties were usually served at important state entertainments. For instance, at the Field of Cloth of Gold, you, Henry VIII would have been shown, I have to put it down now because it's getting so heavy, and I'll bring them out individually. So at the Field of Cloth of Gold, you would have had the salamander. You would have had uh, the ermine. Here is a nice ermine that my daughter again made, all from sugar paste. I don't know what I will do without her. <laughs> you really need an artisan to make them. Uh, a very popular one was the chessboard. And you can see here, oops, my daughter made these out of marzipan actually. And uh, every single figurine, oh, silly, <laughs> is made to two models of chess sets uh, from the Viennese Museum in Vienna. Now, let's put them back here. Um, now, the sweet and, and all of those were mostly served in between courses as part of the main feast. Uh, what you're going to see now would have been served at the banquet only. And we have the different groups again. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you the group of succits. What a name you might say. And we have wet succits and we have dry succits. Now to make you, to help you see, uh, I'll bring over a plate full of wet succits. 
Oops. It's just such a shame you can't taste them because they are really to die for. I hope you can see them. I'm just going to uh, take this one off for the moment. They are very colorful. Now, wet suckets are basically various fruits preserved in sugar syrup and then served with a two pronged socket fork, a little bit like this one. Uh, but the original ones would have had a spoon at the end to spoon the sweet um, juice with. Uh, now, I've, I found a little picture on Google that shows an original one. I hope you can see. I don't own one, sorry. <laughs> uh, they are very rare. If you find one, go buy it. Uh, and um, here we have a very famous one. This is pears in wine. And they were often served in very, very expensive glasswork from Italy. Now this is only a uh, reproduction, uh, but just look at that. It looks absolutely fabulous, doesn't it? This, these gla class glass works would have been imported from Italy in particular. Anyway, I'll put that to one side for the moment. So, also, uh, apple mousse is part of a wet socket. Um, as long as you needed to use uh, something to eat it with, it was a wet socket. I'm going to now show you some of the dry sockets. Let me just put this out of the way again. Otherwise, I am fighting for space here. How cool would it be if you could be all sitting around me? Sucking in. <laughs> right, dry sockets. Um, well, have a look here. Uh, dry sockets were prepared in the same way. So uh, it's fruit that was um, then um, boiled in syrup, but then allowed to dry, to be dried, and then boxed up. And what they used was a wooden box such as this one. Camembert often comes in that type of box these days. But in Tudor England, uh, this is how you would have bought it. Now, right, let's have a look at what a dry socket is. So you have candied fruit. Here I've candied some cherries. Um, fruit peels orange peel, these are absolutely to die for, and they keep forever, it's brilliant. Uh, or fruit pastes, like this one, that's made from cherry, uh, and marmalade. Now marmalade, this is Tula marmalade. It's a dry socket, you don't need spoons or anything. It's actually, look, it's not sticky at all. And um, uh, a Tudor marmalade, um, the word marmalade comes from the Portuguese word for quince, more mellow. And that because the first ones were made from quince, uh, hence we still have the name marmalade. But you uh, also get all sorts of other fruits like, uh, or um, roots like ginger, um, uh, medlar, yeah, and um, this was considered really healthy, even though it's full of sugar, because the Tudor, in, in Tudor age, the notion was that fruit was full of water and therefore um, moist and cold, and that was considered harmful to the body. But by cooking it and by adding lots of sugar, you corrected that into something healthy. So therefore it became some superfood that wasn't just to show off, but it also helped you stay healthy. Uh, then we have Tudor, oops, 
here goes my little decoration. Uh, here you have um, some March, um, 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 not March, but uh, gingerbread. Here, the, the, the red gingerbread and the white gingerbread. And uh, the uh, red gingerbread uh, was made from um, stale uh, bread crumbs, ginger, sugar, licorice, anise, and red wine. And the early ones contained pepper instead of ginger. The white gingerbread here, I hope you can see it, was made, funny enough, from marzipan, um, aqua vita, uh, ginger, and then was molded, dried, and frequently gilded. And I have indeed gilded it with real gold, which you can buy here. Um, then the all famous March pain. And uh, uh, March pain was a confection made from sugar and ground almonds, uh, was often baked on a base of wafers and glazed with rose water and sugar. And these were often also the show pieces at banquets. For instance, my chessboard is made of March, uh, March pain. And they obviously were also painted. And marzipan was just really the almond and the sugar basis to these March paints. Now, let's quickly look at some Tudor biscuits. <laughs> Here we have, oops, I have to make sure I'm not losing some of them. Here we have a plate full of uh, Tudor biscuits. Uh, they started to appear in Elizabethan times and were double cooked. Uh, that means that the dough was first boiled and then baked. Hence you get this lovely round form because the dough was wrapped in muslin, then boiled, then taken out, cut into slices, baked and glazed with sugar. Um, then I've got the macaroons here. These are actually lovely. I love those. And the all famous jumbles, exactly. Uh, and the cracknels. Now, the cracknels, as the sounds suggest, make a cracking sound when you bite into it. And if you're lucky, it was the biscuit that made the sound and not your tooth. Yeah, they're very hard. And then we have got also lovely tarts. To the tarts. And if they are closed with pastry, they are pies. And those are really, really delicious. Um, and these here are Tudor cakes. I don't know whether you can see. And the Tudor cakes are rather dense, a little bit more like bread than our fluffy cakes. Uh, they all include spices and a lot of them dried fruit, uh, like the Twelfth Night Cake, which is this one here. And in 1577, Hollinshed referred to this sugar bread here as one of the ma many outlandish confections indulged by the gentry. Now, let me show you the wafers again, because the wafers are part of the original medieval void and they are so iconic really for Tudor England and banquets um, and you could get them in rolled up versions like this or more commonly like those. Now how do you make them with this lovely design in the middle you might ask yourself. Let me show you. This here 
is a Tudor waffle maker. Can you see the lovely design? So the batter goes in here, you close it up, you put it into the embers and out comes this. And it, it, it does, it's a little bit hard, but they did dunk it into the hippocras. So it was actually quite nice. Um, the last section I take you through is the comfits. Because the comfits, as we've seen before, <laughs> just scattered them all over my um, table here. These um, are basically um, sugar coated either nuts like I've got over here. Oops, let's add them here like that or um, spices. And um, the word comfits in itself derived again from the Italian, uh, from the Italian word confetti. And the word comfit is banquet and goes back to the 1330s and was first applied to gingerbread confections. But by the 16th century, uh, a comfit became a sweet meat, really, um, and included not just spices, but nuts uh, um, as well. These are made from fennel, by the way. They could uh, be colored or white, um, sometimes red, yellow or, or green. And comfits uh, were known in England by, the, uh, by this particular name by 1480. But from about uh, the mid-century in the 16th century, uh, you would see them a lot more in London uh, where there are specialist shops. Uh, funny enough, uh, mostly run by aliens and aliens meaning obviously foreigners from Spain. Uh, and um, the most famous one is Balthasar Sons, who became very rich selling comforts to the Londoners and English people. Uh, comforts um, and sweetmeats, so all of these were actually very well received uh, and highly regarded gifts. Um, we know, for instance, that um, between Edward, Lord Edward uh, Stanley and the master of the horse, Robert Dudley, uh, they included always comfits. And we also know from Robert Dudley's accounts that he was very much self-indulging in comfits and spent a lot more money than he should have done, uh, even before 1579. And uh, such sweet delights were also used as bribery uh, to keep influential people sweet. Uh, and um, food, and in particular sweet food, um, played a significant political role uh, in form of banquets and food gifts. And the authorities tried to control and regulate this excess consumption through means of sumptuary laws, but not always very successfully, as we know. And before we've come to the end of my little talk, I'm going to show you something very special and very iconic for banqueting food. You can't eat it, but it's a feast to the eye. Here, I have a little box, a wooden box. What it is, it's an Elizabethan trench or roundel box. What's inside? Inside, you get 10, 12, or 20, 24 little roundels like that. Now, what did you do with these, you might ask yourself? Well, I always say that's the Tudor equivalent to the Christmas cracker. 
the one where you pull and you open it, it goes bang, and then you read to each other the little joke of whatever is inside. This works quite like that, only it's a lot more beautiful. What happened is that you would use the plain side to eat your stuff from. So you load up, you go and you load yourself up. So you eat this and at the end of it, when conversation runs a bit dry, perhaps you would then be asked in turns to turn it over and you would read the, this motto or poem or verse or sometimes it's a, uh, even a little story out to the rest of the group uh, and that's what you did. Uh, but I think they're absolutely lovely. Uh, and the, uh, you can see them in many museums. I know there's one uh, in um, the British Museum, but I have seen a set, if I remember correctly, uh, at the Met in New York as well. And yes, that's the end. So if you have any questions, I am here to hopefully answer all of them. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Brigitte. You are such a joy. Um, so as normal, if you have questions, you can um, raise your hand. So to do that, you just go down to participants and click there and there's an option to raise your hand and then we will call on you. Or you can just type them, uh, type the question and we'll go through the chat. So there are already three people with their, um, with their hands raised, which is great. And one person also says, how do we buy your book? So um, you gotta tell us that. Oh, Brigitte, I'm not sure if I, Brigitte, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yes. so can you tell us about how to buy your book that you have right, right. there? Right. Um, yes, at the moment, you can buy through me. Um, just send me an email or uh, text me uh, because they are being printed on demand. Because I have to be quite honest with you, I never thought that so many people would want to buy my book. So um, I went for the print um, by on demand option. But in hindsight, uh, yeah, I should have got <laughs> for a lot more. But yes, so it takes about two weeks, but um, can be purchased through me. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's start with April. April, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask a question. Hello. Um, so this is actually kind of taking us back to last year a little bit. You threw out this comment during your talk and I'm sad that I didn't well write it down because I've failed to explain it to people ever since. Um, they would eat cheese at the end of their meal because they thought it sealed their stomach like a lid. Something yes. that's what's in my notes. And I, please tell me again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the the to the way of explaining digestion was in form of a cauldron. So they thought that the stomach is a cauldron that was sitting on a fire and the food inside had to cook before it could pass on through the power bowels and leave the body. Uh, but they also thought that like in cooking, in order to make sure that the, uh, the heat is being retained to properly cook the inside of the stomach, you needed a lid and the cheese formed the lid. <laughs> I have struggled to explain this to probably 10 different people over the last year and they've all looked at me like I was totally crazy. <laughs> 
Well, to to our modern to our modern understanding of how digestion works, it is a. I think it makes the tutors even more lovable for trying to find ways to explain how a digestion works. And I don't need a reason to want to eat cheese for every meal. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's You're welcome. Thank you, April. All right, next one, balance the humors. That's Jen, right? Jen, it sure that's... is. Hi, ladies. Hey. Hi. Brigitte, awesome. I love Hi. following your journey and I just wish I could get to your new home to come visit so badly. Oh. <laughs> it looks I so badly would like to fill the place with Tudor friends. <laughs> oh, it would just be a dream come true. So hopefully travel restrictions will be lifted soon and we can come to that. Um, so I have a few quick questions for you. The first is, um, I was having a little trouble seeing um, up close some of the beautiful um, things you made for your spread today. Could you or Tom take pictures and post it to your Facebook page by any chance? Yeah, sure. I'd love to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, gosh, I really appreciate that. Um, the second question is for the wine, the pears and wine, would they have used a sweet or a dry wine for that? And is that in your recipe book? Yes, hippocras is in the recipe book, but you will find recipes for hippocras even on the internet. It was such a uh, popular drink that, uh, yeah, everybody, wherever in, uh, in Europe you were, people knew how to make hippocras. But generally, it's made from sweet wine. The Tudors really preferred sweet wines over um, dry wines. Uh, and if it wasn't dry enough, they added sugar quite a lot uh, and spices. But you, you can find uh, the Hippocras recipes on the internet without any trouble. Oh, fun, thank you. Okay, last quick question. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that Henry added a banqueting, or no, sorry, that there was a banqueting hall at Henry's Hampton Court, but I just wondered if he added that after Wolsey gifted it to him or oh yes 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 definitely he added it okay great yeah. sorry I find it so interesting there that I just wanted to fi fix that in my mind thank you so much yeah. you're welcome well, as always you're amazing oh. <laughs> thank you OG Jen um Let's see, Patty, I'm going to ask you to unmute as well, and you can ask your question. Uh, let's see, there we go. Hi, Patty. She's not muted. Patty, Patty. Maybe your mic is turned off. Um, in the meantime, while we're figuring that out, let me look through the chat here and see if there is any. Um, yeah, somebody said, can you include Brigitte's email on her website? Yeah, I. Oh, she asked the question here. Okay, never mind, Patty. We will. Uh, we will go back. So um, I will go back to that. So I did post her. Um, I did post her website here. Oh, here we go, Patty. Is the Tudor waffle a relation to the Dutch Stroopwafel? Uh, did one emerge from the other? Ah, right. What a good question. I am not familiar with the Dutch one, but if the Dutch one is of the of 16th century or earlier date, then probably those are, I would thought, very much the same. Because all it is, is really a batter made from... Uh, flour, uh, egg and spices, sometimes uh, added uh, water um, uh, or um, cream. And I'm pretty sure that was universal across Europe. Hmm. All right, I am uh, I'm catching up on the chats here. So Lisa says, how would they have served the comfits? They're so small, would each diner have had their own little bowl? Uh, no, um, quite categorically, 
No, they would not have had their own bowl. Um, that was very, very uncommon. That was something uh, that actually didn't happen right until the very end of the 16th century. And even then it wasn't very common. People were a lot more used to sharing. So you would have a, a big plate in the middle, often called a mess, um, and uh, uh, pe people helped themselves. Usually it was split amongst four people, um, but you were only allowed to help yourself to the side of the dish you sat on. So if you had different items on the plate, you were not allowed to just reach across. You, you had to get the person sitting opposite their attention and hopefully they would then take some and offer it to you but yeah no they picked it up with their hands and uh, yeah it's like a uh, little nibbles you just pick them up see you see and it goes and it is actually nice <laughs> nice and um right after that is a similar question what were the elizabethan comfit dessert plates called the ones that turn over to reveal a story or a saying yeah, um, trenches or roundels. Okay. Somebody wants the email and the title of her book and the links that I send out tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm sending a big email of lots of links. I'll write myself a note. I can't guarantee that I'll remember that, but it is here in the chat, but I will write myself an, an, a um, note too. Um, but also if you just Google, Google Brigitte Webster Tudor 17th century experience. Yeah, yeah. As well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I can uh, give it to you. It's quite, yeah, it's Brigitte.Webster at um, TudorExperience.com. Tudor Experience. And I will um, try to remember to include that yeah. as well. Um, Brigitte did a hip across making video. I think it was on the Tudor Travel Guides show. So Sarah was here yesterday, so I know you guys collaborate a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So we here's something I know on Brigitte's video last night, she showed sugar cones. Would you ask if it was similar to the table sugar that we know today? Um, was it sweeter or not as sweet? Right. Okay. I've got one here. Let me reach. There is one. Okay. Can you hear? It's very hard. Um, so you, you couldn't use it as you see. This is how they bought sugar. So when you went to the market or to the shop, that's how you would buy them. And you then would take it home and you had special tools to scrape bits off. And then you put those uh, bits into a mortar and you would have to uh, really uh, stamp it hard and long to turn it into vaguely what we know today. It was hard work, it was tedious and physically hard work and you had to do it for quite some time. Hence another reason why sugary products like banqueting food was only for the wealthy. They could afford somebody to do it for them. Excellent. Um, could you use a gaiete iron to make wafers? I'm saying that, but gaiet, I don't know how you say it. G-A-L-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Here at the grocery store, we get gaietes. Oh, right. <laughs> Um, we do have modernish waffle makers. Oh, and it's, this is wafers. Maybe I said waffle. Uh, I mean wafers. What yeah, uh, yeah. Um, a waffle isn't the same as a wafer. A waffle is a lot um, thicker and not quite so dense. Let me break off a piece so you can see this. It's very, very thin. Oops. Where's the camera? I can't see. Uh, and it breaks almost like a biscuit. So it's nothing like a waffle. Um, and in order to make these, you 
really do need a waffle, uh, a wafer maker. The funny thing is I have two. Now, why do I have two? Because they come up in auctions here in England, uh, often in general auctions where people have no idea what it is. I bought both in general auction for very little money because auctioneers don't know what it is. Look, I've got two. <laughs> uh, so I now, I go around auctions and when I see one, I buy them. So when people come, they can make waffles <laughs> or uh, uh, wafers, basically. But I can't see how you could make them otherwise. I suppose if you know somebody who's good in um, I making metal work, it should be easy to, to make a reproduction though, mm. I would have thought. I'm quite happy taking photographs and sending them on for some very able people who could maybe make one. Would be amazing. Here's an interesting question. Were any Tudor foods introduced during the times when Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon or Anna of Cleves? So foreign foods perhaps coming in. Yeah. Um, for Anne of Cleves, very, very unlikely. A, because um, the marriage was so short and she had little time to influence the fashion of food. Uh, also, German food at the time was not very well regarded, um, simply because um, they had even less than the English. <laughs> Um, Italians had a lot more to offer, Germans a lot less. With Catherine of Aragon, definitely, and one would have been sugar. The, Span the Spanish had access to sugar, cane sugar, uh, about a hundred years before the English did. Uh, because of the uh, Moorish people in the south of Spain, these are the people that introduce sugar and sugar work and anything how to use sugar and food to them. And um, Catherine of Aragon would have known a lot of those. In particular, Rhodes sugar, which was a real speciality. And um, here, that is the upmarket form. That was the expensive form, and that was the cheaper one. But they really smell of a rose, and I made those for, uh, yeah, for Susanna Lipscomb uh, not too long ago. She asked how they tasted. So I thought, well, I can't explain it. You have to eat it. <laughs> yeah, she, she would have uh, done, and the oranges, but uh, with oranges, they would have been in the country before, but she would have helped to make them even more popular. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And pomegranates too, maybe? Uh, yes, but again, the same. Pomegranates were known before her arrival, but she would have helped to uh, make, them more. make them more popular. The, the thing with pomegranates is, uh, that the tree does grow here in England, but it hardly ever produces fruit. Uh, where with oranges, if you keep them somewhere sheltered, uh, you can actually grow fruit. So it Fantastic. might have made them. Yeah. All right, here's one. The sugar pieces like the chessboard and the ermine, were they made just as decorations or would they have been eaten? Right, that's a very good question, actually, because it's one of the sections I had to take out because my talk would have been too long. <laughs> um, in the early stages, they were made to be eaten, and they often created plates or bowls made from sugar work. So you first would drink your wine out of this uh, bowl or the glass, and then you would eat it. But as time progressed throughout the 16th century, these table decorations grew in size. 
<laughs> and they sometimes were massive. They had to carry it in on a huge plate. And those were then not eaten, uh, but just um, possibly given away as a souvenir. Perfect. Um, maybe I missed it, but how long has she studied Tudor feast stuff? Me? <laughs> oh, that's hard to say. Um, I would say in this almost obsessive manner, <laughs> um, five to six years. Yes, it was actually an American friend of mine who drew me into it. I started doing a bit here and there and she said, you know, you've, you've got to really dig much deeper into this subject. You can't just do a little bit. Oh God, you've got to do this properly, woman. So I did and I, yeah, it's taken over my life. Nice, that's not a bad thing. Um, and you were a cookery teacher before, right? Yes, so, and a uh, history teacher, yes. Cookery and history teacher. <laughs> yeah. Good combination for that. <laughs> so you have a, a history of that as well. Yeah. So <clears throat> here's somebody says, where can you buy sugar cones today? Do we know where we can buy sugar cones? Right. Um, I know that there are various companies in the US uh, that specialize in anything reproductive to do with uh, Tudor history. Uh, I could find out contacts if people are interested. Here in England, you can buy them from reenactor fairs and markets. Okay. Um, let's see, Tudor food all the time. Yes. I want Brigitte to decorate my home, give her all my money and send her to auction for me. So <laughs> there you are. Um, and then somebody says she knows her furniture too, because you do know. I want to go live with her. So people want to come live with you and learn. I'll um, happily adopt anybody. <laughs> okay, this sounds silly, but I just looked on Amazon and I actually found a wafer maker very similar to Brigitte's. So they have modern ones, I suppose, now as well. Oh, fantastic. And did Henry, <laughs> did Henry or the Queens or Elizabeth have any special banqueting food that we would know of that they loved and had to have? Um, right, we, we have records of Henry actually enjoying fresh cherries and strawberries. And that also applies to Anne, Anne Boleyn. Um, we know that Elizabeth was given chess sets made of March pain, and uh, we know that um, Mary was given um, comfits at the christening of Prince Edward. So yeah, there are various um, uh, particular uh, records where we know for sure that they ate that and they liked it yeah okay perfect now here Tiffany wants to know she said I used pinto beans common beans for my pottage I was looking it up and they were brought to Spain from Central America in the 15th 1500s 15th centuries but when did they make it to England ah <laughs> It's one of those questions where even food historians debate it over and over again. Um, it is most likely that they were taken by the Spaniards and the Portuguese from the Americas to Southern Europe first. And from there they started to spread. But there is no 100% evidence when that exactly happened um, but I think it's safe to say it happened give or take 10 years either side of 1600 so 1592 about 1600 1610 so that they showed up in pictures a lot earlier but not in recipes or cookery books and that's where the dilemma lies 
we know they were familiar with them, but we have no evidence actually ate them. Gotcha. Okay. Um, you froze up there a little bit at the end, but I think we got that. People are saying um, Colonial Williamsburg sells sugar cones. So, and also a place called Townsend does sugar cones. So if people want sugar cones and um, here's somebody says a couple of people mentioned Dia, Dia de los Muertos uh, sugar skulls being a form of that sort of, I suppose I, can't tell when that was real. Oh, in Mexico, they make sugar sculpture as party favors is up here. And then somebody says Dia de los Muertos um, sugar skulls would be a form of that. So there we go. Somebody says Jane, C Jane Seymour liked to eat quail when she was pregnant. Yeah. And Honor Lyle, when her husband was captain uh, of Calais, was always was sent over um, eggs or, and, or yeah. sent over quail in hopes that her daughter would yeah. have a place in court. Um, did the Tudors really eat wild boar? They did, yes. Um, it was one of their favorites, uh, in particular the head. <laughs> um, um, but it was a meat that was mostly eaten by the nobility and not by the commoners because uh, you had to hunt it and only uh, the nobility was allowed to hunt. Uh, and therefore, yes, it was definitely an upmarket meat. Gotcha. Were their favorite, or what was their favorite cheese during the Tudor era? Were, what was a favorite cheese? The English? Anything foreign. <laughs> um, foreign cheese was well regarded. Um, local cheese was looked down upon in the 16th century. Um, we do have records of uh, Chester cheese, but it was really uh, the food of the commoners and would not feature anywhere in, as part of a feast or nobility. Gotcha. Um, Lisa said we, we should have a future Tudor con at your house, so I might hit you up for that at some point. <laughs> Uh, and somebody put boar in their pottage. It was very interesting. Come on out to Texas and have a hunt at my at uh, my farm at or at any farm. Sorry, come on out to Texas and have a hunt at any farm. Hunting boar was dangerous. Boar are crazy here. Oh, apparently in Texas. Hey, I, I, <laughs> peacock or swan when people wanted to show off. Is that true? Um, it was more a medieval thing. Um, so those stuffed swans and um, uh, stuffed other birds started to really lose its uh, speciality a little bit du during Tudor um, feasts and banquets. Um, why, I am not quite sure, but somehow the, the novelty had worn off more or less. But you see, so often um, in London, they were way ahead with their food fashions and somewhere more rural uh, going north, they would have probably still done it if they wanted to show off. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it's more a, a medieval thing. Gotcha. That was the final question that I see here, and it's 9.15 for me. So it's time for um, Samantha. So I am going to say thank you so much, Brigitte. You are, as always, so generous with your knowledge. We love you so much. Um, we will see you in person in TudorCon next year, I believe, right? You guys are coming. So um, we will get to see you again next year. And, um, and, and yeah, so thank you. And uh, thank you for the pottage recipe as well. And, and for all the work you put in. Thank into you. And thank you everybody who has come to watch me. And uh, <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to lots more pottage videos and pictures. Fantastic. Yes. Um, tag Brigitte then when you post your stuff too. All right. So thank you. And thank Tom for all of his help filming things. I know he said he couldn't breathe. That was his sacrifice. So his, we, are, we are grateful to his lungs. 
Um, so Samantha, can you do me a flavor? Can you raise your hand so that we can make you the co-host? Because I'm not sure if I can find you here. Um, is, oh wait. I'm here. You're, there you are. Hi, Samantha. Hi. Hello. Um, we are so excited. Okay, let me just, uh, there we go. Okay, so it's your turn. It's time. <laughs> Do you guys remember Samantha from last year with where she deconstructed a gown or re reconstructed a gown and she <laughs> how to get dressed to Tudor style. That was fantastic. Yeah, people are saying they loved it. It was amazing. Oh, thank so you. You thank are you. back. Yeah. So for people who don't know you, you are a tailor at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. Yes. And you research historical clothing. Yeah. And you've got a new theme for your talk this year. I on do. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to turn it over to you. And then okay. at the end, when people have questions, um, I'll read them out to you. But for now, I'm just going to turn it right over to you. Okay. okay? I'm going to hopefully share my screen. So are you the co-host? Let me make you the co-host. Oh, okay. You are the co-host. Now you awesome. should be able to share your screen. Okay. People love your glasses, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it seems like um, they're even more important nowadays with wearing masks. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So do you see the button to share your screen? Oh. Now there we go. Oh, there she is. Is it working? Yep, sure is. Okay. All right. So let me go to. There you are. Okay. Wow. Is it working? Can everybody see <laughs> once yeah. it comes up? Awesome. Maybe. Yay. There it is. Awesome. Okay, good. It's always kind of a bit of a miracle when things actually happen. Technology worked. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, so this is um, a talk that sort of picks up where I left off um, last year's TudorCon. I really focused on the clothing worn during Henry's reign and worn um, by his wives because I did sort of a little poll in the TudorCon group and that was the topic that got the most votes. But the other topic I um, wanted to offer was how fashion changed during Elizabeth's reign. And since that one um, was the runner up, I thought it would be perfect to do this time around. Um, and it's, it's such a fascinating thing because she did reign for a really long time. And even though we sort of have this generalized idea of, you know, our image of Elizabeth, actually a lot happens during this time. So the image here on the right is, I think, kind of the, the stereotypical image that we picture in our heads or that most people, you know, the average person on the street probably pictures when they hear Queen Elizabeth. And it's really imposing. It's a huge dress. She has a huge ruff and a veil and all these sorts of things going on. It looks really unnatural, probably uncomfortable. And it's kind of condensed into the image on the left, which is your very stereotypical Halloween costume idea of Elizabeth, where we have, again, the big rough um, framing the face, a big dress. But where does all that come from? How much of this is real? And we know that Elizabeth was very particular about her image, especially when the portrait on the right was painted near the end of her life. She really wanted to maintain and project an image of majesty and power. So even though this is the image that most of us have in our heads, this isn't how Elizabeth looked or how fashion looked for the whole of her reign. In fact, the image that we associate with Elizabeth here on the right is really only from the ending years of her life. So I wanna look at what was being worn throughout her reign by her and by other noble women, as well as some lower, women lower down on the social scale as well, so that we can see that fashion during Elizabeth's reign was not a monolith. It actually changed quite frequently and everybody was interested in keeping up with those fashions however they could. So I actually want to backtrack just a little bit to start with fashions 
during the time when Elizabeth was princess, right before she became queen. So this would be in the late 1540s. And this is a really lovely group image of the family as Henry wanted the family to be known, showing his true wife, Jane, um, Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth there. And this is probably one of the earliest images that we have depicting Elizabeth as princess. The clothing that Elizabeth wears in the 1540s still has what we consider to be very much the Tudor or Henrician look with the very wide sleeves. Um, and in fact, in the 1540s is when the sleeves get to their absolute widest and it's balancing out the skirt, which has also gotten very wide. Um, you also notice in both Mary and Elizabeth, the neckline, while somewhat shallow, is still very wide, almost coming off of Elizabeth's shoulders in that case. And it's very square as well. To mirror this, you'll notice that the hair and the French hood have started to become less round and a little more oval, and it starts to widen at the sides here. And another interesting thing, particularly in relation to Elizabeth during the 1540s, is that while we know that Ca Queen Catherine of Aragon was very influential in bringing the Spanish farthingale or the hoop skirt to England, it really was not widely adopted after she brought it. Um, it was probably seen as just sort of an odd Spanish fashion, but over time it became widely adopted as the fashion um, became for wider skirts. So by the 1540s, farthingales are being worn pretty regularly by noble and elite women. And the very first reference that we have to a farthingale in the royal wardrobe is a farthingale that was made for Elizabeth. And it was made in 1545 out of crimson silk satin. And the farthingale that you see here on the left is currently the only known extant or surviving farthingale. And this is actually made out of yellow linen and it's stiffened with what were called bents in the period. And these were long dried grasses or reeds that were bundled together sort of like a rope that was then inserted into the channels. And this would help hold out the skirts and you see some Spanish women um, on, the, on the right here depicted wearing their farthingales and the skirts have been tucked up and you can see them there. So basically from the 1540s forwards, we're going to see um, farthingales in their various forms being worn um, in fashion. Once we get into the 1550s, the sleeves start to become smaller once again. They're still big, but they're not the same width that we saw in the 1540s. It also becomes very fashionable for women to wear dark, usually black partlets um, to fill in the neckline of the gown. So as we saw earlier on Elizabeth and Mary, the necklines were open showing their chest and neck. It becomes fashionable to fill that in with a, another garment that was worn on top called a partlet. And it could be either black velvet, like the ones that you see here, and they also have embroidered linings and they flare out like that. Or you could also wear a linen partlet and I'll show some images of that later. I also really want to point out that their French hoods have gotten a bit more square and a bit wider at the top. Um, and this is something that continues throughout the 1550s. But that type of gown is not the only gown that's being worn. Um, at any given decade, there's going to be very different types of styles that are worn um, so that people can suit their clothing to their activity, the weather, whatever they have going on, and to their own personal style. These gowns are interesting because it's a style that you're going to see in one form or another throughout the rest of the century. And it's basically a gown that is loose or semi-fitted that is then worn over an underdress called a kirtle. And in the portrait of Mary, as well as Elizabeth Lady Cavendish, they're both wearing these long, loose gowns um, trimmed with fur, and they're worn over kirtles, which you can't really see too much in this image here. You can see a little bit of the skirt of Mary's kirtle um, peeking out from under her gown, but we'll look at some other images later. One thing that I also want to point out here on both of these women is that they have a little ruffle around their neck, which is probably attached to 
a linen partlet. And I'll, I'll show you more of those in a second. But this is really important because if this is the beginning of the rough that we so strongly associate with Elizabeth's reign and with fashion from the Elizabethan period, this is where it starts in the 1550s, this tiny little ruffle. So these are linen partlets. Um, the example on the left is an extant or surviving partlet. It doesn't have a collar, um, but because they could sometimes be attached and taken off because it's easier to launder um, when you have these separate elements. The partlets on the right might look a little funny because they're actually taken from images of laundry that's being done. So you may have to turn your heads sideways a little bit to see them. But these partlets have collars with attached ruffles on them um, that could be set and ironed into the figure eight shapes that you see. And I'll talk about more about ironing and starching ruffs a little bit later. But you can see these are just simple pieces that get tucked into the neckline. These examples all have strings which help keep it um, tied around the chest and help keep it down underneath the neckline. And this is an example of a woman and her husband, a knight and a gentlewoman. So they're not the most elite, um, but it's a nice example, a little bit more full length image um, of what that sort of loose or semi-fitted gown looks like when worn over um, the kirtle. And you can see the skirt of the kirtle underneath the gown here. This gown also has both the puffed sleeve on top at the shoulder, and then there's a long hanging sleeve that kind of goes down the side of the body there, which doesn't really serve any purpose except for fashion. So now we get to Elizabeth as queen. And I, I think everybody's familiar with this portrait, but it's important to point out that this is actually a copy of the original coronation portrait that was lost. So we don't know exactly um, you know, how closely this followed it, probably very closely, but just again, to be taken with a grain of salt, it may not accurately represent 1550s fashion because it was painted 50 years later. But in the 1550s, these are now the earliest images that we have of Elizabeth as queen. And what is so striking to me about these images is how different Elizabeth presents herself and her clothing to Elizabeth at the end of her reign. In both of these portraits, she's wearing similar gowns to what we saw on Mary and Lady Elizabeth, where it is a long black semi-fitted gown worn over um, a kirtle or an underdress. And while everything about them does indicate wealth and status, the black color being very hard to achieve, so true black was a sign of wealth and status. She's wearing gowns trimmed in ermine, which of course was restricted by sumptuary law to being worn by the royal family and all that gold. There's still an understated um, luxury about it, which is very interesting. I want to point out that the image on the right of Elizabeth, she is wearing a French hood, but the veil has been flipped up over her head. And this is something that you'll see in portraits throughout the rest of the 16th century. It was just a, a popular um, thing to do sometimes if you felt like it in the same way that you see um, the veil of gabled hoods earlier during the Henrician period getting flipped up in all sorts of different ways, just something to change up your style. But again, this combination of wearing a long semi-fitted gown over a kirtle, we're going to see throughout the century, and this is sort of the 1550s version. Um, as we move into the 1560s, again, we have the long, loose, semi-fitted gown worn over a kirtle, and here you can see the kirtles um, much more clearly on Elizabeth and both Lady Burley here. And one thing that you'll also notice is that there's a lot more emphasis being placed on the shoulders in the 1560s. You get either puffed sleeves that again have additional slashing and puffing on them, but there's this emphasis to create width there at the shoulders, but the rest of the sleeve is very much closely fitted to the arm. You'll also notice that the rough has grown larger since the 1550s, but it's still pretty restrained, especially as we'll see later on in the century. 
here is another version of that semi-fitted gown. Um, and it, this one fits more closely to the body than we've seen previously. This one is also fastened from the neck down to the waist. And there's actually aglets or little ties that go all the way down the rest of the gown so that you could close it completely. But here again, you see emphasis at the shoulders, but still a slim fitting sleeve the rest of the way down. This one has that loose over gown, um, probably not as fitted as the other examples that we've seen, and it falls away from the body a little bit. But again, that emphasis at the shoulders through all of the puffs. And this is just a quick um, series of me in my fitted um, 1560s gowns so that you can see the layers that are underneath. Um, on the left, I'm starting out in my smock my linen smock, which is the women's basic undergarment. And then I have a petticoat, which is made out of red wool. The bodies, which is the period term for the bodice or the upper part of the garment, has no boning in it. Um, it's actually made out of a stiffened paste buckram. So it's linen that's been stiffened with hide glue. And that provides all the support that you need um, for these gowns. There's no boning that's being used during this time period, although we'll see it come in at the end of the century and I will address that a little bit later. In the next image, you see my kirtle that's worn over the petticoat and I have sleeves attached. And then you've got the, that semi-fitted gown with the puff on the sleeve to give emphasis on the shoulder. There's also another style of gown, and it's probably my favorite style of gown from the entire 16th century. Um, this low necked um, gown, it has that curve to the bodice. And now instead of having the neck and chest open as we had it in the Henrician period, it's almost always gonna be filled in with a decorative partlet and ruff. So here we still see that emphasis at the shoulder, although this is a one piece sleeve that tapers down um, to the wrist, still very close fitting. And her skirt is most likely being held out with a farthingale. For many of the fitted um, or semi-fitted gowns that we were looking at earlier, they probably weren't worn a, with a farthingale, but these almost certainly were. And just more images of a very similar style gown. And here, I love this image on the right because you can see all that beautiful um, pearls and embroidery that, is, that are decorating partlets now because they've become so fashionable to wear you're finding all sorts of embellishment on partlets during this period. More examples um, and a new style of shoulder treatment, these, the sort of roll or puff here in the late 1560s, the really exquisite partlets and the trim on both of their bodices is very similar and it serves to help kind of create a more narrow look to the torso when you have those diagonal lines leading to one single point and then just emphasizing that rounded neckline on the bodice. So this is something that a more average woman would be wearing. Again, that fitted or semi-fitted gown worn over a kirtle, very, very um, common and fashionable throughout the 16th century, but this is the 1560s version of that. So I wanna talk a little bit about ruffs themselves since they're so iconic, but I think a bit misunderstood in terms of how they work. They almost seem like they defy gravity in a way, but this is um, a satirical image because there are monkeys here um, going through all the steps that are necessary for starching, ironing, and setting ruffs. And I'm going to take a close up here because on the left is a ruff that I made before it has been ironed. So the figure eight curls, or they're called sets in the period, are actually not part of the ruff itself. It, that's not how it's constructed. It's actually just gathered to a band and then the figure eights or sets are put into the ruff by ironing it. And here you see that the monkey woman on the, the right who is seated is ironing um, a ruff that is damp with starch and she's using what's called a poking stick in the period. You may have heard it called a goffering iron later, but that's not the term used in the 16th century. And the goffering iron is made out of iron. And you can see the little monkey on the other side is heating up coals in a brazier. And it's the heat from the coals that heats up the iron, very much like a modern curling iron. And then that is what is used to create the sets. Depending on the size of the poking stick, 
that's the size of the set that you get for your rough. And the size of the set will change throughout the century as we will see. So these are, this is a rough that I made and you can see it both on a stand and on me as well. And the size of the set again is just created through ironing and starch. There's nothing else, there's no wire, um, there's no tricks here, no plastic horsehair braid or anything like that. It's not pinned together. Um, it's all through the magic of ironing and starching that that's created. So moving into the 1570s is when we start to see fashion on its up, upward climb as things just get bigger and bigger. And this is really where it starts. There's still emphasis at the shoulder now on these very vertical shoulder rolls, but you'll notice that the shoulders are getting wider. The shoulder rolls are sitting further away from the neck, almost off the shoulder to create as wide of a look as possible. And this is really to help create an illusion because if you have very wide shoulders and a very wide skirt, it will make your waist look smaller without having to do anything to your waist itself. I also wanna point out that the set of the rough, the figure eight of the rough has gotten much wider than it was in the 1560s. Not only have the, the size of the figure eight of the rough gotten bigger, but also sleeves themselves have gotten bigger. Remember in the 1560s, it was a very slim sleeve that fit very closely to the arm, um, but now it's gotten quite big, um, very full sleeves here. And you'll notice that the ruffs at the wrist are in proportion to the ruff at the neck. And here again is the 1570s version of that semi-fitted gown being worn over a kirtle, the gown having a high neck and a collar and the kirtle being low neck. And you can see the, the kirtles distinguished very well here on the right in this image by Lucas to here. There also becomes a fashion that really takes off in the 1570s of women wearing gowns with high necked bodices or even really doublet style bodices. Doublets of course being a male garment. And so there is some ridicule there, especially from Puritans. Um, such as a man named Stubbs. He often writes satirically about how women are almost dressing like men because they're wearing these doublet style bodices. But you really see this take off in the 1570s. So we have Elizabeth here, and she often is depicted in this style in the 1570s and 1580s, almost exclusively um, from that point onward. And um, Lady Paget here also in a doublet style as well, the roughs, now that we're heading into the late 1570s, the roughs are getting much larger now. In the 1580s, things reach really their, their biggest in terms of width. Um, and we see the biggest sleeves, the biggest roughs, and the biggest skirts. Um, and you'll notice that the shoulder point that had started to get wider and wider in the 1570s is really at its widest in the 1580s. So you have very much an, like an inverted triangle look to women's bodice, women's torsos in this time, where it's very wide at the top and it comes narrower at the waist. So it's, it is interesting that even though things reach an extreme during this time period, it's still very balanced that you, the size of the ruff is in proportion to the size of the sleeve and the size of the skirt. And you also may have noticed that the size of the hair has gotten much bigger as well. And this was a style known as frizzing. So the hair would be very tightly curled and then you would brush it out to create this heart-shaped style. And this is um, something that you see um, in the 1580s here. And some rare full length images. Um, and you can see just how wide things have gotten, especially in the skirt. Although comparing both of these images, obviously the one on the left is much wider than the one on the right. It's hard to say which of the two is a more accurate depiction of um, the width of Elizabeth's gowns, but I'd say it's probably somewhere in the middle. But the one on the left is, is just really good for showing how extreme in terms of width things have gotten in the 1580s. So all of those images that we looked at just now from the 1580s showed those doublet style high necked bodices, but there are still the lower cut bodices um, that are still being worn 
during this time period and these are some examples of them. However, you'll still notice the sleeves are really big still, the ruff is very big and the hair as well. And I also just love Elizabeth Bridges little dog <laughs> in the bottom of the portrait with her. So there's a reason um, that things are able to get so big during the 1580s. And it's probably because this is when we begin to see whalebone being used extensively in fashion for really the first time in fashion history. Most people associate whalebone and boning in corsets with the 19th century, um, but it begins here in the 16th century. Now whalebone is a bit of a misnomer because it's not bone at all. It's actually baleen, which is a keratin substance. So the same thing that your fingernails and hair are made out of. And baleen comes from obviously the mouths of baleen whales. And it's the plates that hang down from the mouth of the whale you can see here on the left. And it's the hairs on the plates just thousands and thousands of plates in the mouth of the whale that catch um, krill and fish and those sorts of things that the, the whale will then swallow. The thing about whale bone is that it is incredibly flexible. Um, it gets cut down from these plates that are harvested from the mouth of the whale into whatever size, whatever thickness and flexibility you need. And the other thing about whalebone is that it is a thermoplastic. So as it's heated, it will form and retain the shape of whatever it's molded to, including the human body. So that makes bodices or bodies of the 16th century that are boned with whalebone actually very comfortable because it's molding to your figure as opposed to really um, altering you. So whalebone is not just used um, in bodies or bodices as I'll talk about later, but they create an understructure for those really big sleeves that we've been seeing in the 1580s and they become known as farthingale sleeves because it's sort of like having a little hoop skirt for your arms. And it's actually in farthingales that we see the earliest references to whalebone as early as 1582 in the wardrobe of Queen Elizabeth. She has a, um, a farthingale that's actually remade to have whalebone in it. So she is adopting new fashions as they become available. And um, this, however, is not the very first time that whalebone was used in a farthingale. Actually, Mary, Queen of Scots, beat her to it and in 1562 had a whalebone farthingale. But remember that Mary had spent time in France and it seems to be that the French were using whalebone earlier than the English and it took time for it to really take off here. But by 1585, um, we see farthingale sleeves specifically mentioned in Elizabeth's wardrobe. Of course, that very extreme large style that we're seeing um, on Elizabeth and other very elite women is not what most women are wearing. And here we can see some images from some gentle woman, so still well-to-do women, and it's, it's a much less extreme silhouette. We don't see the huge skirt. The sleeves, however, are still large, not as large as we saw on Elizabeth and her ladies, but still large in a way that's trying to keep up with fashion. And you'll see these ladies here again are wearing that tried and true semi-fitted um, gown worn over a kirtle. And that it just seems to be very popular with this class of women and slightly lower, so that sort of middling class, just a, a true mainstay of the wardrobe for these women. Now the 1590s is when things go a bit crazy. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put it. I don't think that prior to the 1590s, Western fashion saw anything quite so unnatural. When you look at this, there's really nothing about it that looks like the natural human form. Um, and there's really just nothing to compare it to. And a lot of this has to do with whalebone becoming much more prevalent in how garments are constructed. It really allows you to have these huge understructures because the bents or the reeds and grasses that were being used before can't maintain really large circles, they'll collapse on themselves. But whalebone, however, essentially being, if you think of it like plastic, 
can maintain those larger shapes. So in the 1590s, sort of beginning in the late 1580s, but really in the 1590s and is when we see a new shape of farthingale. And you'll notice that there's this very harsh line where it drops off. It's no longer that tapering cone. It's very um, straight. There's a really straight drop off. And sometimes it's called a drum farthingale for it by modern um, costume historians because it gives that sort of shape to the skirt. And you'll also notice that the bodice has become very elongated, but that's really just at the center front. In the back and the sides of the bodice, it'll still be at the natural waistline, but the front of the bodice is really long because they're trying to create this very extreme shape. The ruff is also very large and the sleeves are still large here. So I mentioned a little bit about whalebone being used in bodies. Now this is may not look very revolutionary, but this is actually incredibly revolutionary in the history of women's Western fashion. Prior to the late 1580s and 1590s, what we think of as the forerunner of the corset did not exist. Um, as I mentioned before, the bodies of my petticoat um, were stiffened with fabric, layers of fabric that had been stiffened with glue and quilted together. So there was no boning being used to provide support to the figure. But by the 1590s, we see boning being used in bodies. So channels are stitched in layers of fabric and then the pieces of whalebone are shaved down to fit very snugly into those channels and they get slid into the channels there. So we see Elizabeth Vernon on the left, very scandalously portrayed at her toilette, getting ready, but you can just barely see in this image the channels there of her boning. And the, the image in the middle is of a pair of bodies that didn't belong to Elizabeth because they were created just after her death, but they were created by her tailor for the, her effigy, which was going to be carried around in a funeral procession. Um, so it gives us a, a good idea of the kind of bodies that Elizabeth was wearing at the end of her life. But in Elizabeth's wardrobe accounts, the first record that we see of bodies with whalebone is in 1590. And she has a French bodies with whalebone made up for her in carnation taffeta, so sort of pinky color. And it's from this point on really that women's, the stiffening for women's gowns or women's clothing is going to come from a separate garment and then a gown will be worn over it as opposed to having the stiffening being integral to the gown itself. Now I mentioned the change in farthingale shape um, and this is something that seems to very clearly come from the French as opposed to the Spanish farthingale of earlier periods. And we don't have any surviving French farthingales from this period that we know of at this time. So there's possibly still one out there and let's keep our fingers crossed. But we do have this image from the 1590s of costumes made for a mask. And we see the women wearing petticoats over a French farthingale. And it's possible, costume historians believe, that the men on the left are wearing just French farthingales. So this is what has really informed um, our idea of what a French farthingale might look like. Uh, but hopefully, as time goes on, we may be able to learn a little bit more, perhaps get that, you know, much sought after image or, or extant to help us even more. But for now, this is what we think it might have looked like. As I mentioned before, though, that very extreme shape, very unnatural shape that we saw on Elizabeth early on is not what's being worn by the majority of women. However, they're still taking influence from what Elizabeth is wearing. So you can see there's still a similar shape to the skirt here where it comes out pretty straight from the waist, but then drops off. It's just done with a much smaller farthingale, perhaps even a roll. Um, that is being worn tight around the waist to give that emphasis just right at the hips. The sleeves are still large, the ruff is still large, but again, nothing quite like what we're seeing on Elizabeth in that portrait. So um, 
that is a very quick, very brief um, overview of 50 years um, of changing fashions during Elizabeth's reign. And I wanted to end on these two images together to show the change in Elizabeth as well as the change in fashion from the beginning of her reign to the very end of her reign. And to think about everything that's happened during her time as well. It's, it's a time during of English history that is one of the most popular times because of so many things that happen. And there are so many changes that happen as well in fashion. So hopefully as you're going through your own personal reading and research of Tudor history, as we all love it, this talk will hopefully have given you um, some ideas about what Elizabeth, her ladies, those key players looked like um, during that time period. And I will turn it over to Heather to answer questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Samantha. That was amazing. Um, people are saying great talk, great talk. And as usual, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Otherwise I will go through some of the chats here as well. Um, somebody did ask, where do they import the fabric from mostly? Okay, sorry, I'm trying to find out where my Zoom went. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think I can take your sharing off. Uh-huh, okay, that'd be awesome. Well, I don't think I can actually now that I say okay. that. Gloria, maybe, maybe Gloria can work some magic there because I am not sure. Um, but That's all right. I can hear you anyway. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so fashions are, there we go. There you are. Hi. Um, hi. hi. So fabrics come from a variety of different places and it really depends on the type of fabric that you're talking about. And when I mean type of fabric, I'm really more referring to um, fiber content. So during the 16th century in England, wool actually forms the backbone of the British economy. So it's their number one export. Um, it's really, really important to, um, to England's economy, so much so that Elizabeth actually mandates that everybody has to wear a black woolen cap on Sundays to try to maintain the, the British woolen industry. However, you do have competing wools coming from Spain. Um, and even today, we still have merino wool. You may be familiar with that term, that's Spanish wool. Um, but wool really is, is, is English. It's synonymous with England. There's not quite um, silk production yet in England. When we think of you know, the Spitalfields um, silk manufacture, that's, that's a bit later. So silks could be coming from places such as Italy. There's a very common silk manufacturer as well as France. Um, but you could very likely be seeing things coming from the East, China, India as well in terms of silk. Um, linen can also be produced in England or Ireland especially, but you, the best linen is going to be coming from places such as the Netherlands um, where they're also extremely good starchers as well. And some of the most intricate, beautiful ruffs that we see in portraiture from the period and into the 17th century is from the Netherlands. So. It's interesting that even in the 16th century, there's very much um, a global economy in terms of textile production. Sure. And just to tie it all together with some of the speakers yesterday talking about the reign of Edward VI and um, Kett's Rebellion and the land enclosures and Seymour, that of course was because of the wool industry and closing off those common lands to graze right. for the wool. So you see it all comes together. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, cool. Okay. So there are a couple of hands going up here too. Lisa, let's go with you to start with because you're first on the list here. So. Hi, Samantha. That was phenomenal. Quick question. Um, when you had said how like ermine and other things were just for royals. Would that have changed like when Mary became illegitimate and Elizabeth, would they have had to change what they had worn or would that be an exception? Cause they were still technically, you know, Henry VIII's children. How would right. that have worked, do you know? That's a really good question. I actually haven't looked into how that would affect them specifically um, as their legitimacy changed back and forth. I hadn't thought about that. That's really great. I do know, however, that the sumptuary laws as a whole were actually very difficult to enforce um, to the point where they were more um, symbolic than they were actual 
laws. Um, much of the sumptuary laws, when they were enforced, it was enforced by telling on your neighbor, essentially. So someone would have to be annoyed with you enough to report you to the authorities. And if you paid the fine, you could continue wearing your thing. So um, the, the sumptuary laws are very interesting and could be their own talk themselves. Um, but that perhaps might be the simplest answer. But that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about how it might affect the princesses and their changing legitimacy. So that's something to, to look into. I'm thinking that possibly the, the Henry Fitzroy was considered royal all the time, even mm. though he was a So they still would have been considered the royal. Yeah. Friends. It's not as if they were, like he was saying, no, they're not mine. Right. They're just, she's just not next in line. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, yeah, that's neat. Yeah, it is. Um, okay, uh, April, you're next here on my list. So go for it with your tiara. Ah, I took it off. I was starting to get a headache. They're heavy. <laughs> <laughs> have to be honest um so farthingale sleeve huh what <laughs> like <laughs> i'm 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 imagining the the shape with with the boning how the farthingale goes down in a skirt so i would guess it would kind of do like a diamond so it looks sort of it's very similar to at least this is what we think it may look like we actually don't have any surviving examples but it probably was a completely separate structure from the gown itself. So something that would have been put inside the sleeve when you went to wear it. And this is because of how it's written in Elizabeth's wardrobe accounts. Um, okay. But it probably followed the same shape that you see in those sleeves where most of them are really big at the top of the shoulder and they get a little bit smaller. And it probably was just, you know, rings that went down that, had, that were connected as well. So probably it didn't look anything like a farthingale skirt, but it was yeah. just the idea of using um, something underneath to help to help prop it up. But have yeah, we can only guess. Yet? Pardon? Am I making one yet? I have not oh, just because I haven't needed to do 1580s yet, but um, it's definitely on the wish list. So someday, hopefully. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, April, for the question. Um, Patty, let's go to you. So I've asked you to unmute and you can ask your question. Um, or maybe you put it in the chat again. Oh yeah, look, she put it in the chat. I'm, <laughs> on, to that. I'm on to that now. She said, I'm using patterns in time to sew my garb. Do you have any other reliable, oh, patterns in time, I guess, is the, the name. Um, do you have any other reliable pattern makers and as I cannot make a corset that satisfies me, satisfies me, do you know of a mostly period correct Tudor or Elizabethan corset source? Okay. So I, um, I am more than happy to give out a really big list of sources, um, including books, um, if anybody wants to email me. Um, but to answer that question specifically, um, in the simplest way, I would recommend um, the Tudor Tailor, which I think um, a few of you are probably already familiar with. They, they're really the um, premier researchers and suppliers for making your own 16th century clothing um, in, in a very accessible way. They have a shop on um, Etsy that you can purchase from, or you can go straight to their website um, to learn more about them. And they also have a new book coming out next year, which is going to focus on the clothing of common people, which I'm really excited about. Um, but pretty much most of the styles that I talked about today are available from their original book, The Tudor Tailor. Um, you can also purchase paper patterns from them also, because if you buy the book, there's tons of great historical information, but the patterns are one size on a grid. Um, so you would... You, if you feel more comfortable using a paper pattern, you can purchase from them. But quick answer is Tudor Taylor for that. Um, in terms of a ready-made garment, I'm less familiar with available suppliers just because it's not something I usually need to find for myself. Um, but I think you would be happy checking out the Tudor Taylor um, and seeing what they have available in terms of patterns. And that might actually help you realize you don't necessarily need a corset to make what you wanna make for this period. Mm, perfect. Awesome. So um, let's go to Irina. Irina, I have asked you to unmute. So 
you can ask your question. Okay, so um, my question would have to do um, with how um, Elizabethan uh, clothing has evolved, um, more in regards to Elizabeth. And mm -hmm. I know I'm not going really, I'm not going to take into account like the influence of the rest of Europe because the fashion was kind of similar in many ways. Um, but I noticed that it seems like um, Elizabethan fashion becomes more and more covered up compared to like the early 16th century. Mm. So does this have something to do with like Elizabeth's persona as the Virgin Queen and her clothing kind of looking like an armor in a certain way? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I don't I don't know that there's like a single answer to that, but you are correct in that you do tend to see more coverage than you did previously. Um, although there are some styles in the 1590s where the chest is open and the ruff actually just frames the face here. So this isn't covered as much. Um, I like believe- her, her son, what's the portrait of Elizabeth where her dress goes like all like you see and then she's got the ruff in the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The rainbow portrait I think it is, yeah. Yeah. And there is a quote from an ambassador, I can't remember from where, but he mentions that Elizabeth wears, tends to wear her partlets open in a way that's more associated with unmarried women. So there's almost this idea that, that showing more is from younger unmarried women and covering is more for, for older women. And so it's interesting that she actually kind of goes back and forth in a way um, between covering and uncovering, depending on how she wants to be portrayed. Because in some, like in the Armada portrait, where she would want to seem very powerful and more militaristic, she is very much covered. But in later portraits, like the rainbow portrait, where she's um, not that same kind of feeling, it is much more open and, and revealing. So. Yeah, I hope that that answers a little bit, but yeah, it's it a very interesting concept. Well, thank you. So I'm definitely going to check out about it more because it seems like such a complex topic that deserves <laughs> to be explored. <laughs> yes, it is definitely, but that's what makes it fun. Yeah. I'm thank also you. thinking with that time period too, just that we see the rise of Puritanism and the shutting down of the theaters and right. you know, that, that kind of stuff. And I just wonder if that's like related, that might it might be like this whole movement to. <laughs> oh, you definitely, the Puritans definitely like to complain about fashion and that's where we get some really good information about fashion is mm -hmm. from them complaining about it. Um, but I think that almost shows that they probably didn't have as much control as they would have liked. <laughs> Right, 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 for sure. Okay, um, let's see, Carla, go ahead and unmute and uh, ask your question. Hi, Samantha, thank you so much. I think your talk is super fascinating. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask about the starching process um, mm -hmm. with the rust. Uh, what was the starch made of? And then also, I know today we sprayed the starch on. I'm sure they didn't, they weren't able <laughs> then so was it like a bowl of liquid and they would have dipped the rough in it so just a little bit about that process right so one of the finest starches to use is wheat starch because it actually becomes very clear um, if you make it well and a clear starch is going to help you create maintain that really fine look to linen so the wheat starch itself is a powdered form and you mix it with a little bit of um, hot water to kind of create a paste and then you can water it down more to get the consistency that you want depending on how stiff you want your item to be. And so then that can be worked in with the hand with hands into the fabric of the rough and the excess can be scraped off as needed. Um, you, that's what I use when I set my roughs today actually. Um, and you have to remember that things like potato and cornstarch wouldn't have been uh, used since those are new world um, vegetables. Um, uh, so yeah, I hope that helped answer your question. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm mute. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, Gina. <laughs> it's Gina's turn. Gina, who won the costume contest, I do believe. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Heather. And thank you, Samantha. Your presentation was absolutely incredible. Um, you've definitely inspired me to take on some more <laughs> complex Elizabethan cosplay in the future. Wonderful. Um, I apologize um, because I missed the first few minutes of your talk. Okay. So forgive me if you covered this already. Um, I'll no. have to go back and check out the recording if you did. But um, if you haven't already, could you talk a little bit about um, before the support garments, like um, the whalebone bodies were in place, what kind of undergarments were women wearing during this yes. era? Um, so I had images, <laughs> which, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's fine. Um, so the, the support garments that you see prior to the separate boned bodies are the petticoat and kirtle that are being worn under the outer gown. And both of those are full length garments. You might almost think of them as a dress. So the petticoat, even though the word we think of today means just a skirt, in the period, it meant the skirt and the bodice that was attached to it. And the bodice for a petticoat and a kirtle would have been sleeveless usually um, low necked and the bodice itself would have had layers of stiffened fabric essentially quilted together. And that is what su provided support to the figure. And I have made supportive kirtle bodies for a wide variety of figures and have been able to achieve um, support and fit regardless of um, size. So it can be done. You can make a supportive bodice without boning, and they clearly did in the time period. But again, the kirtle and the petticoat both are those bodices with skirts attached. And as you move into the late 16th century, things become detached, and you have now the separate boned pair of bodies, um, they're often called. And especially you can see on Elizabeth's um, there are eyelet holes worked into the bodies around the waist so that you can tie the separate skirt petticoat to the bodies. And then you get that single garment, but it's a little more interchangeable there. So I hope that answers your question. And then you'll be able to hopefully see those images I'm talking about um, in the recording. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. So thank you, Gina. Okay, Sloan, let's um, have you ask your question. I've asked to unmute, or maybe Sloan decided there, to put it. Am I, am I there? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Samantha. I loved your talk. It was oh, I'm great. so glad. I was wondering when you say you make your bodies without the, or your stays without the boning and you use hide glue, mm -hmm. and how many layers of fabric do you use? Is it linen? And where do you get your hide glue? Sure. Um, so you can get hide glue from art supply stores because it's used for sizing canvases for painters. And depending on how you mix the hide glue, because it comes in little dry pellets that you need to heat up on the stove and then it becomes gluey and you add a certain amount of water to make it stiffer or less stiff. Um, buckram, paste buckram, as it's called in the period, is made almost exclusively with linen. And I usually try to find a really good heavy linen um, for my paste buckram, but I don't just use paste buckram. I usually also use a couple layers of untreated linen as well. And I often put a layer of wool, like um, sort of like a wool broadcloth because the, the squishiness helps prevent any hard creases that might form under the bust. Um, Tudor Taylor actually sells pre-made paste buckram if you don't want to mess with making it yourself, but I thought it was really fun to try making it myself and have had success with that. The nice thing about making it yourself is you can also make just exactly the amount that you need as well. Um, but yeah, so I don't, I tend to use paste buckram with at least a, a couple layers of linen as well. So I have a second question and that okay. is, what do you use to iron to form your, your roughs? I use a curling iron. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so the nice thing about curling irons today is that there's been sort of an evolution in curling iron form. So we all grew up with the ones with clamps. They don't make, well, they make those still, but they also make ones without clamps, um, which 
is really great for making ruffs because it's one less thing to worry about. They also make tapered curling irons now. Um, and I have a curling iron. My smallest is half an inch and my biggest is an, like an inch and a half, inch and three quarters. So there's a wide variety of sizes available now too, depending on if you're making a little wrist rough, I use my half inch or a big late period rough, I'll use inch and a half, two inches. Um, but yeah, just a regular curling iron. It helps if you can take off, if it has a plastic tip, if you can unscrew that, it helps because you can get the curling iron as far into the rough as possible. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, that helps. It can, it's fun, yes. but uh, just watch your, watch your hands. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so now I'm going through the chat and I'm just starting where I left off and uh, going to, do you have a rough pattern that you'd like to share? Oh. And what kind of starch do you use and what do you use for now? Oh, well, that was where we talked about that. Okay, that was your Sloan. Um, wonderful pictures help to explain and help to understand the difference. That was amazing. Did Elizabeth block the women of the court from wearing black or white as they were her favorite colors? Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly say for the rough pattern, it really depends on the size of rough that you want, but I will, when I put together like a, a list of um, resources, I'll include a rough resource in there as well for making your own. Um, the, the mention about Elizabeth's colors is really interesting. Um, I have not found any evidence that she restricted those colors. And in fact, black, is one of the most common colors that you see women depicted in in portraits. Again, there's that association, association with it depicting wealth because true black as a dye is more difficult to get than other colors. Um, and it's also interesting that even though Elizabeth mentions them as her colors, um, she herself does not even limit herself to black and white. She wears a variety of colors and um, Actually, as, I, as Heather might remember, my hope is that for next year's TudorCon, I will talk specifically about color in Tudor clothing um, because it's, it's really fascinating. Um, both what was being worn might surprise you. Um, but yeah, I have not found any mention that limited um, black and white. What you really do see being limited is true purple um, on silk. So if you had a true purple on another fiber like wool, it's, doesn't, it's not regulated the same way that a true royal purple is on silk. That's only for um, the royal family, but also crimson is regulated um, for certain levels as well because crimson coming from a source called Kermes is very expensive to get. So that is regulated as well, but there really isn't any regulation I've seen on, on black or in relation to Elizabeth, what she considers her colors. So. Okay. What kind of ornamentations were used and did they have any significance? Oh, so I wish I could see in real life some of the things that are talked about in Elizabeth's wardrobe because they sound just amazing. Um, a lot of what we see in Elizabeth's wardrobe accounts is a ton of embroidery. Um, and this is embroidery done, you know, in real gold, real silk metal. They also use, you know, precious stones, but there's a lot of mention of embroidery in Elizabeth's wardrobe. And it's of all sorts of things, not just geometric designs, um, you know, flowers, bugs, spider webs, um, all sorts of cool things. And also lace being laid on top of fabrics as well. Um, in terms of significance, I don't think there's really any symbolism that I've come across in terms of things um, specifically, but there's just a, a really wide variety, but embroidery seems to be the number one um, form of embellishment during this period. So um, either couching threads, stitching threads on top to create designs or, um, or using silk threads to create different images on them. Fantastic. Okay. Um, what did they use as dyes for the different colors? Oh, like, that's <laughs> tune in next year. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's a, uh, yeah. So there's 
a huge variety again, depending on, on colors. And of course it's all natural dyes um, because we don't see synthetic dyes coming until the 1850s. But even with natural dyes, there is a huge range of colors that are possible. Um, much of it is plant dyes, um, but you also see, I mentioned Kermes before and as well as cochineal, which you may have heard of, those both produce reddish, red purple colors and those are bugs. <laughs> So there's a, a wide variety of things that are used. Um, and it, it does affect price to a degree. Like I mentioned, black is, is harder to achieve, so it's more expensive, but it, it rarely, it, it will affect a person's ability to own a lot of garments in that color, depending on your class. But, um, but yeah, hopefully I'll get to talk about that more. <laughs> There's a there's a madrigal that talks about the cochineal cochineal oh, wow. coming in, and it was it was called the it's a, a madrigal that's all about the excitement of all the trade in the new world and the stuff that's being discovered, and it talks about boatloads of cochineal, and it was so when you say that, <laughs> oh that's you great. Like that. Um, okay, so I heard many times fat black fabric was very expensive. What is used in the dye to make true black? You kind of talked about that a little bit. Do you want to go on? Yeah, so there's a few different recipes um, out there for, for achieving true black. And it can often be a mixture of different substances so that you're kind of building up layers of color. Um, so for cheaper blacks, you can actually tell they're cheaper because they'll fade to whatever colors underlying were used for them. Um, and it's not just dyes that are important in achieving um, color, especially black, oh, hello. <laughs> Here's a black cat. Um, <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> um, you put me down. But, I know, but it's also um, um, mordants are the other part of dyes which help really set the dye. And so iron mordants are often very common in black dyes um, to help really set that true black color. But <laughs> I wish I could put them back up. Um, but you'll notice that sometimes they, they talk about certain black dyes becoming rusty as they get older because it's that iron mordant that's coming through and they actually do kind of get that reddish brown hint to them. So yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so gosh, there's so many questions. Oh, no. and I don't know how, how we're going to um, people want your email, people want your all of that kind of stuff. So okay. maybe um, you can send me that list of resources sure. and then I'll, I'll send it out. Um, gosh, I scrolled down to the bottom to see how many there were and then I've lost <sighs> where I was up at the Okay, here we go. Shamala, what a fantastic presentation. Always wanted to learn more. Thank you so much. Yay. Um, you mentioned that France was somewhat ahead of England in adopting new styles. Was this the case in general across previous centuries as well? Has France Ooh. always been ahead? <laughs> That's a really good question. And actually, you've caught me at the beginning of my interest in fashion. <laughs> um, I, which so I'm in, I'm also in the SCA Society of Creative Anachronism. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so funny that like, I'm one of the few people who really loves doing what they call late period. And everybody's like, yeah, medieval. And I'm like, eh, mm -hmm. eh. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I, I don't know because I, I don't really study prior to, I think my interest really starts in like the 1490s and I really want to do more early, early Tudor stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm not a medieval <laughs> person. I would think, and maybe some people can know and say in the chats, but I would think like Italy might because just of the trade, like with Venice and the Venetians yeah. being able to have all of that trade, um, that yeah. with the East that was certainly. off limits, maybe that, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. Um, you also see quite a bit of regionalism, um, and that's true for prior to the 16th century and also really in the 16th century, England is kind of in an interesting place because they seem to be the ones who adopt other people's fashions more than other countries do. So I think there's even a complaint from some Puritan about how English people have no true fashion, they just steal it all from everybody else, which mm -hmm. I think is, is really funny. Um, 
but yeah, so the Spanish are very set in their ways in terms of clothing, which is quite funny. Um, and, that, and that's not just in the 16th century, it, it continues for many centuries after that. Um, but yeah, England loves everything, which is very amusing to me. That's so interesting. It's so interesting how cultures come across because England, like when you look at the English language, it's an amalgamation of German yeah, and German and everything. Is kind of like England tends to be this stuff where people go like, because of all the invasions and right. all the people who, and so there were all these different groups who all had their, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Right. How across right. And moving them too. Okay, um, how must they have laundered them? What about laundry, laundry? Yeah, so the interesting thing about clothing during this time period um, is that you're only really laundering in the way that we think of it, certain items of your wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And the items that you're really laundering, you're, you're hitting it with soap and water, you're scrubbing it, those are your linen undergarments. So anything that's gonna to be touching your body, absorbing all the sweat and the nastiness. So for men that's shirts and women that's smocks. Um, also things like aprons that are gonna get super nasty, um, women and men's linen head coverings. And you'll notice all of those things are made out of linen and it's almost always white linen. And linen can be scrubbed, it can be boiled and laid out in the sun to bleach. It's a very durable fabric. So the idea is that wearing your linen undergarment is going to protect your outer clothing from you, from, from absorbing the sweat and all that thing. So yeah. your outer clothes don't need to, to be laundered in that way. There, the outer clothing can get spot cleaned. And if you look at, um, and I'm sure Brigitte has seen this in her recipe books, there's actually a lot of oftentimes uh, recipes for different stain removal things. Um, my favorite analogy for it is to think about your, your business suit. So you'll take that to get dry cleaned every now and then, but you're wearing a new shirt and new underwear, hopefully, every single day. <laughs> and you're washing your underwear every, you know, wearing new underwear every single day. And that's also the way that they kept their bodies clean, um, was by changing out that body linen as often as possible. Hopefully at least, you know, Elizabeth undoubtedly was changing it every day. For, for the average person, it was probably less than that, but that was how you kept yourself clean. Um, again, with wool being such a common and popular fiber, wool um, can have dirt just simply brushed out of it. So there's other ways to maintain clothing that don't include soap and water. And a lot of that is, is maintenance, it's brushing, it's things that we don't really think of today because we're so used to tossing them into a laundry machine or a washing machine. Um, but there are, there are other ways to maintain clothes, which is what they were doing. Ruth Goodman has um, writes those books on how to be a tutor. Yes, has, oh, um, I love her. <laughs> isn't she great? She has one, um, I think it's called How to Be a Tutor, where she talks mm -hmm. about the undergarments and how they would have changed them and stuff too. So if people want to know right. more about laundry and keep yes. them Yes, her. and her Tudor Monastery Farm series is like oh, amazing. I love it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, did the noble ladies, would they loosen their layers of their clothing when they were pregnant? Yes, yes. So you don't really see purpose-made maternity garments during this time period. And honestly, not until um, much later centuries do you see purpose-made maternity garments. Um, most women's clothes can be laced and adjusted. You can slip a stomacher, which is like a, a, a piece of fabric decorative to make things bigger. Um, and that's part of the reason that you don't see as many um, permanent fastenings or buttons, that sort of thing on women's clothing. There's so many more lacings and that sort of thing. And also why straight pins are very much an important part of women's dressing as well, because you can pin things in place, pin fabric over gaps and that sort of thing. So they are, even elite women are adjusting their clothing to their situation. And um, Tudor, the Tudor Taylor actually has a book about um, Tudor children's clothing, but it also co goes over um, the progression of women changing their clothes. And um, one of the authors, Nimia Mikhaila, actually happened to be six months pregnant at the time they were doing photography for the for the book. So she got dre completely dressed um, in her normal clothing to show how it would have been adapted. There are um, a handful of portraits where you can see women um, in 
you know, clearly pregnant and how they've adapted their clothing, usually by changing um, some kind of stomacher or something. But again, that semi-fitted loose gown I mentioned that was so common throughout the 16th century, there's probably a reason why it was so common because it could be adapted easily by changing what you wore underneath it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, let me see where we are. I'm, I know I'm gonna miss, so the, like, I'm still looking at chats that came in at like a half an hour ago at oh. questions. So um, I, there's no way we're gonna get through I know, all I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, you know, but this, you know it, it, people are fascinated by it. So it's great. Um, and so you definitely have to come back to TudorCon next year too. I would and love to, I love TudorCon. Then people can <laughs> get you at lunch and just- yeah going to have a little queue of people just waiting to talk to you at lunchtime. Um, so I'm sorry, we're, we're definitely not going to get to everybody's questions considering I'm still reading ones from half an hour ago. Um, so please, I will send around your um, socials and your website and email or what all whatever there is there um, and people can get in touch with you too. So here's a couple final questions. How do they store this stuff? I have a hoop skirt from my wedding dress, Anne Boleyn inspired, and I can't imagine storing multiples. <laughs> well, in the Tudor period and for a few, a couple centuries after that, they weren't using closets the way that we think of them to store clothing. Mostly clothing is stored flat and folded and put into chests, you know, layered with herbs and things to keep bugs away, to keep them fresh and smelling good. Um, and it also helps because obviously these clothes um, were you know, a bit heavier than what we're used to wearing. And if you hang them, they're gonna pull a lot of strain on the, the clothes. So usually they're stored flat in a chest or that sort of thing. Um, Elizabeth, of course, because she had so many clothes, mm -hmm. had, her whole, had a whole building herself for all of her gowns. So those were kept in the royal wardrobe, which was its own separate facility. Sure, sure, okay. Um, let's see, Victor, okay. So there's somebody who makes gowns. Um, Patterns are pretty easy to tailor. Um, one of the things I noticed is how Elizabeth's portrait when she was around 16 is that she had sloping shoulders. Is there any thought that she might have worked to make her shoulders look bigger so that she looked stronger? The V of the shoulders to waist and inverted um, definitely makes her waist look smaller. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. I, I, if she did anything, it was through the clothing itself. And what I think is so interesting about clothing of the past, particularly, you know, 16th century, but also other periods, is that it's more about using the clothes to change how you look, as opposed to changing yourself to make the clothes look a certain way, which is what we do today. We always right. try to make ourselves by dieting or working out to fit an ideal, whereas in the past, it didn't matter what, what your body type was, you just had clothes that, that would make a certain shape. So it may almost be easier in the past to achieve a fashionable ideal because it was more about the clothes that you put on them um, to achieve those shapes. So what you see when Elizabeth is princess is just a different fashion ideal where you do have those more sloping shoulders. And then as fashions change, it's a way of making the clothes to create that more broad look. And another thing to remember is that during this time period, clothing is being made by tailors, being made by men. And one of the primary ways that tailors work is through, at least in the 16th century, is by adding padding and stiffening to the clothing itself to create the ideal form. So if you're familiar with men's clothing from the time period, there's a fashion for the peas cod belly, where it makes them, uh, I don't like it, but <laughs> it makes them look like they have this little belly. And obviously it's not their body, but it's padding and shaping in the garment itself to achieve that ideal. So you're able to use fabric to yeah, create the image of yourself that you want based on fashion or personal taste. Perfect. Okay. It's now 1029 here, 429, 129. So <laughs> we end this, um, but Parting is such sweet sorrow. Um, we will see you next year at Tudor. Absolutely. And you will send, somebody asked, are your images going to be available? Like it's all on the recording here. Yeah, it's so, all on the recording and I'm happy to share these. Um, well, I'm a little scared about how big that file might be, but um, I will do my best through, um, you know, through emailing me and the resources to try to give you as much as possible. 
Um, and if there's a specific image that you want, I might be able to send that to you. But uh, yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> yep. All right. So this was so much fun. We are now going to go. We have one more thing left. This was the last talk, but we have one more thing left, which was um, the Tudor trivia. So Rachel is leading with um, the Chicago trivia guys are doing Tudor trivia. And there's a separate Zoom link for that. I'm going to... Um, posted in the chat, but it's also in your programs, but I'm just posting it there in the chat too. And they are ready for us because I told them 4.30. So they are ready for us in that Zoom room. Samantha, thank you so much. You have been amazing um, as always. And we can't wait to see you next year and talk about color and, and everything like that. So um, awesome. All right, so I'm going to post this Zoom link again. Rachel Dixon is going to be leading the trivia. We've got some prizes for the trivia winners. Um, so check that out. And that's kind of the way we're going to complete the weekend. Um, also, yeah, I'll send out an email. If you're not coming to trivia, I'll send out an email tomorrow with all the links and everything too. And just thank you so much for being here and for being part of this. But I'm going to head over to trivia, to the trivia room right now too. I'm not going to play, but we're going to see, um, we're going to have fun with that. So going to go over there. All right. Thank you, you guys. See you in a minute and, uh, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. Okay. Here we go.